Good morning, colleagues, and, and welcome to the 26th meeting in 2018 of the Finance and Constitution Committee. Um, can I just ask those who are attending today and all the panel members as well to make sure their mobile phones are put into an order which doesn't interfere with proceedings? I'd be most grateful. Uh, the first item on our agenda today is to decide whether to take consideration of our draft pre-budget um, in private at future meeting. Are members agreed? Yes. Members are agreed. Our next piece of business is to take evidence in a round table format. Um, today's round table will build on the evidence we've already received from our calls for views uh, uh, on, and our fact-finding visit to Brussels last month and the comparative research we commissioned on what happens in other countries in regards to common frameworks. And today we'll be hearing from, and I'm just going to mention the, the individual's name and their institution and not go through, otherwise I'll be here forever with some of the titles. Uh, Professor Michael Keating from the University of Aberdeen, Daphne Velastari from the Scottish Environment Link, Professor Colin Reid from the University of Dundee, Jonathan Hall from the NFU Scotland, Ian Wright from the, from the, uh, from the University of Glasgow, Professor Paul Bowman from the Royal Society of Edinburgh, Michael Clancy who's from the Law Society of Scotland, Lloyd Austin from RSPB Scotland, and Anthony Salome, who's from the Scottish Centre for European Relations. So thank you, everybody, for coming along and being prepared to contribute in our deliberations this morning. We found, as a committee, these panel sessions can work very, very well in terms of teasing out the issues, allowing people to contribute uh, as freely as possible. And it's certainly intended to be a free-flowing discussion. So, if you, but if you manage to catch either my eye or the eyes of the clerks, please, please do so, and we'll try to get you in as much as we possibly can as part of the, the discussion we have ongoing. Um, it would, the, today's discussion was based around four themes. Um, a different member of the Scottish Parliament will be leading on each one. And, and I intend to allow about 30 minutes for each of these discussion areas. Now, as usual, there's a bit of crossover on these things. Um, so if, we, if, if sometimes we stray into the areas, that just that might happen by the natural process, and that's what free-flowing discussions do. So let's see, let's see where we get to. I'm really looking forward to this. Um, and the person who's going to really kick off the session this morning on the area of principles and policy areas of common frameworks is Willie Coffey, MSP. And Willie, over to you. Thanks very much, Bruce, and good morning, everybody. I'm Willie Coffey, MSP for Kilmarnock and the Irvine Valley. Uh, I was hoping to start at the very beginning, at basic principles. And uh, Professor Keating and others, you, you said that it's as if we're working on the detail before the basic principles have even been worked out. And I wanted to just test whether other members and contributors felt the same thing was in place. It seems to me that the policy areas that, that we're, we're possibly discussing in the frameworks, it's kind of like a pack of cards, but we don't know who's dealing them. What, what the rules are for distribution of those, what the discussions will be, and contrast that convener with the experience we had in Brussels recently, where we heard from a number of jurisdictions where there seemed to be clear and, un and well understood agreements about the area of hierarchy of laws that are governed by principles of supremacy and so on that, that you mentioned, Professor Keating. So, should we be starting there and putting a bit of effort in that area first? before we even argue and, and worry about the detail of how the frameworks will operate. Michael, you would kick that off. Uh, yes, I, I think that, that is right. There are, there are two processes that seem to be going on. One is about broad principles of what the internal market means. And at one level, it seems straightforward. But once you get that down in the detail, the, comp the concept of the internal market is really extremely complex and we have nothing like that in the devolution settlement because we didn't need it because Europe looked after that. And then there are these deep dives about individual policy fields that the civil servants have been working on. Those two are supposed to meet and I'm not sure they ever are going to meet. Uh, and then there's the problem with the, fr the basis for EU regulation, whether you can download that EU model into the existing devolution settlement. I don't think you can without rethinking it. And Finally, where we end up is, I think, where your point got to, is we're going to have a whole range of mechanisms for dealing with intergovernmental relations. We've got the existing mechanisms for non-EU matters. We've got frameworks, some of which will be legislative, some of which will be non-legislative. We've got the individual sectoral bills, like the Agriculture Bill, and there'll be an Environment Bill coming up. And then we've got matters to do with 
negotiation of international agreements that hardly has been started, the discussions hardly started, and then various ad hoc measures. And, and the whole thing is so complicated that the, it's difficult to see how anybody could really understand it. Uh, the reason this is happening, of course, is the timescale. Uh, and we're trying to uh, address really important constitutional issues in a scale, time scale which is very limited. We still don't know how long the time scale is going to be, well, how long this transition period is going to last. But whatever it is, even if it's three years, that is really not long enough to think through the implications for our constitutional settlement. So we could end up with a terrible muddle. Okay. Who would like to chip in on, on this discussion in this area? Michael, I can see you're desperate to say something there, because I know the Law Society have made some comments on this area. So <coughs> would you like to give us your reflections on that? Thank you, Convener. Um, uh, well, uh, um, I, I think you're reading too much into my expression, to be honest. Um, uh, but, well, you, you asked for it. Now um, say a few words, Michael. Um, uh, take, let's, let's, for example, take the, the timescale. I agree entirely with that analysis that the timescale is far too short. Um, it, 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 I think I've submitted something to a, another committee uh, in the Parliament recently which gave scenarios for um, how things would go if we had a, an October withdrawal agreement um, uh, reaching over to uh, the, uh, the 29th of March next year. If we had a November withdrawal agreement because at the time when I was writing it everyone was talking about the idea that there would be a European Council sketched into November, which would give us that uh, arrangement, um, a December uh, uh, agreement, uh, which of course is now, uh, time has been allocated for that, that at the European Council, but that's looming, even though we are only uh, at the middle of, uh, or uh, towards the end of October. And then lastly, uh, if there is no agreement and what happens, um, and uh, let's say at the last opportunity in October, what happens then? So um, if it's 154 days today, I checked our Brexit law countdown clock this morning, 154 days today until the 29th of March, uh, then if you take out uh, the, uh, the various holidays and recesses, uh, you're looking at not an awful lot of parliamentary time at all here, or in London, or indeed in Europe, because we tend to forget that under Article 50, uh, MEPs have the possibility of voting. So I agree with the time scale. The time scale is short, um, uh, and decisions made in a rush to try to meet a time scale can sometimes not be the best decisions, and they take an awful lot of energy and time and thought to get them right. On the idea of uh, the detail before the principles, um, the 111 uh, powers which the Cabinet Office uh, identified and sent to the Scottish Government um, uh, more than a year ago, more than a year and a half ago, um, uh, seemed to me when I was doing the, the survey of which the Law Society published of those powers that these are very complex, very detailed areas of the law. Um, they, they require a significant amount of specialisation to be able to understand them. Uh, and uh, the, the sort of um, uh, the makeup of that li list of 111 gave me the impression that a general call had been sent out to Whitehall from the Cabinet Office saying, tell us those intersection areas between uh, the EU and devolved matters. And they got back various returns. Some of the returns are duplications or uh, the, the the clustering of them might have come from different departments. And I think that that's, that's something where um, uh, we, are, we are actually um, dealing with a thought process which was at the very beginning of the, the whole uh, uh, idea of withdrawal, before um, the, the full consequences of that uh, had been uh, identified, uh, even after the referendum. Uh, and, and I think in the 111, uh, we also get these varieties and, uh, of mechanisms which are currently used. So there is a memorandum of understanding in relation to certain agricultural matters. Uh, there is a, a primary legislation in other areas, let's say um, uh, pollution prevention and control, and subordinate legislation across a whole raft of other things too. Uh, and, and that's important 
uh, because these varieties of um, mechanisms uh, make it difficult for us now, in retrospect, to start thinking about how do you fit this into a concept of a common framework analysis when what we've been doing up until now has been anything but common. Uh, and if you'll indulge me just one more moment, convener, um, I, I think the, uh, in, in looking at the list of 111, um, firstly, we know that the total list was 153 uh, and that uh, some, related, some aspects relate to Northern Ireland, some related to, no to Wales, uh, and uh, then there was a core group which related across the UK. But also, if you dig into the 111, let's say, in food and feed law. Well, uh, our current analysis paper stretched 125 pages. But if, if I were to add the uh, Food Standards Scotland uh, digest of food and feed law, it'd be something like 500 pages. Uh, and who around this table has the expertise to tell me what the analysis of mineral water is all about? You know, that's, that, that is, that is where, where uh, that's the level of detail which some of these uh, pieces of law go to. Um, and I've probably taken up too much time already. I'm glad that, that contribution, because that allows me to bring in Lloyd Austin from RSPB, because RSPB have also made comment on this area where you express some concern in respect to the Cabinet Office's provisional assessment, the policy areas. Would you like to just flesh that out, Lloyd? Yeah, um, I think, first of all, convener, I agree with both Michael Keaton and Michael Clancy about the, the time scale and also the issue that um, devolution arrangements, um, in a sense, uh, took account or, or were, were developed with the EU situation in, in place and that if that EU um, uh, level of uh, governance is removed. Uh, there is a need to uh, to think about how that is replaced. Um, so we very much welcome this discussion about frameworks, etc. Uh, partly because environmental issues are inherently cross-border issues. The environment, whether it be airborne pollution or wildlife movements, etc., don't, don't respect political borders. And one of the reasons why we very much supported international measures. To, uh, to deal with, whether that be global or European bases, uh, to address environmental issues is because of that uh, cross-border nature. Um, and, uh, you know, in terms of that Cabinet Office paper, I think there were a number of things related to nature and the environment that we thought were not recognised as something that does require, within the UK, cross-border um, <coughs> cooperation. Um, uh, we highlighted, for instance, uh, invasive non-native species, which ov obviously is an issue that needs to be addressed uh, in cooperation, at least, if not uh, uh, in a common way. Um, because, and, and that illustrates an example of how the environment often needs to be approached biogeographically rather than by jurisdiction. And by that, I mean you might want one approach for Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, where species are different to those in Great Britain, England, Scotland and Wales. Um, and, and therefore, I think there are, there are ways in which in environmental areas you need to approach things in a biogeographic way, which means, I think, you need better intergovernmental mechanisms in order to address them. I think we certainly uh, think that the, in order to respect the devolution settlements, each uh, jurisdiction needs to have the authority and the accountability uh, that the devolution arrangements give those uh, jurisdictions. But there needs to be a mechanism to ensure proper coordination, consistency to, del to deliver that cross-border, those cross-border mechanisms. Um, and there are ways in which we could learn from things that exist in the EU at the moment, such as intercalibration, which is a technique of setting environmental standards under the Water Framework Directive. Um, that, that's, a, that's a way of working, which could be a form of a common framework rather than a legislation or a non-legislation. There are so many different forms of common framework. Um, so I think that's probably what I will say as an opener. And, Thank and you, Camino. The, the question really started off from Willie as well, 
Lloyd, about do you think there should be a set of common principles established before we get into the detail? Is, is that something that that SPB would support, or are you a bit more relaxed about that? I, I think from an environmental point of view, if such a set of principles existed, we'd like to see a recognition of the, the, the cross-border nature of the environment being one of those principles. Okay. Any other anybody else want to contribute at this stage on that particular question? Angela. Sorry, yep. convener. My, my question was actually um, a, a slightly broader one. I was conscious uh, that Michael and uh, Lloyd had, um, you know, laid out um, a raft of detailed work um, that needs to be undertaken. I mean, there's an enormous <coughs> amount of detailed work. Um, but I suppose what I'm interested in, in, in trying to get my head around is how much of a priority is resolving some of the details uh, in and around common frameworks actually going to be, uh, given some of the evidence that we've heard from the Scottish Centre for European Relations, which, uh, again, picking up on the scenarios that Michael uh, was beginning to lay out, that, you know, there's this broader, you know, negotiation and scenarios around, you know, deal or no deal, hard, soft Brexit, transition periods. Um, and I think it would be quite good to hear from, from, from Anthony about, you know, is there going to be the capacity um, to actually, you know, prioritise some of the work uh, on common frameworks, um, given, you know, the broader uh, political situation? What do you, Anthony? Uh, thank you, convener, and good morning, everyone. Um, I suppose to pick up on, on Angela Constance's question and building on what everyone else has said uh, before, clearly, um, Timing is, is quite important. Um, as Michael Clancy mentioned, um, we're in the countdown to a deal or no deal scenario. And, and presuming that we do have a withdrawal agreement, uh, clearly this will only include a political declaration on the shape of future relations between the UK and the EU. That means that even if we have a deal uh, by October, November, December, or even I think January could probably be the latest moment at which the European Council would be willing and able to do, endorse a final agreement. Uh, we won't know the shape of the UK's future relations, and obviously that has concomitant impacts upon the way in which the UK and Scotland can prepare uh, internally. Now, uh, the UK government's current proposal is, is the, the Chequers proposal, beleaguered as it is. Uh, that would see the UK re remain uh, ostensibly aligned to a number of areas of EU law. Uh, which might mean that in practice things may not the the the, the, the impact things may not change as much as, as we might expect. Uh, we may sort of internal configurations might be required to, to produce relatively similar outcomes. Uh, but otherwise, we wait to see how those negotiations progress, and we may not see the shape of, of a final uh, final settlement between the UK and the EU until months, if not years, after Brexit Day in March of 2019. Uh, so I think the, that the uncertainty which we have may well persist for some time, uh, and it makes it very difficult to prepare anything on that basis uh, within Scotland or indeed the UK. In terms of the capacity question, um, I think that depends on the scale of the change which would be required, and as I say, we don't know what that will be. Um, if I could just make maybe one or two other points building on from what other people mentioned. Um, in terms of the European Parliament having a say on the Brexit uh, deal, clearly it does. Um, I think it's important to highlight that, that, that the European Parliament has set out clear priorities of what it's looking for, uh, and that obviously it may, it, it may well reject a deal. It's not given that the Parliament would accept a deal, but I also think that, that the Parliament's overriding priority has been citizens' rights, uh, and the current withdrawal agreement provides a number of uh, safeguards and provisions in that area, so it may well be that the Parliament does decide uh, to vote through the deal, and obviously it leaves the UK Parliament to decide what it wants to do. Um, maybe I could stop there, convener. Yeah, I've got a couple of people want to contribute. Paul, I think I saw you wanted to contribute. Yes, well, I, I think we, the, it's true that a lot of things are unknown until we know whether there's a deal or not and what the shape of that deal will be and therefore how much priority might be given to this issue of, of common frameworks. Um, I, I think one of the, the key points actually relates to, I think, your theme three, but I think we need to make it even now. In order to identify the principles and the policies that should come within fr common frameworks, you need some institutional development because who's going to do it? Who is going to identify what should be within these common frameworks? At the moment, what we have is a, is a, a list prepared of very specific things, sp particular bits of legislation. Nobody has sat back and thought, well, what is the UK internal market? 
uh, conceptually, what should it be? Therefore, there's nobody doing the kind of fundamental research that's needed to think through what policies should be within any possible common frameworks. And that therefore points towards the need to set up an institutional solution before you actually decide on um, the substantive points. So in fact, I think you can't, in a way you can't not come to point three. I mean, that, this would be the RSE's position, I think, that you've got to have um, some kind of institutional solution. We recommend an independent secretariat because there needs to be someone whose job it is independent of the, 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 the players, so independent of the UK government, independent of the Scottish government, the Welsh government, the Northern Irish executive, if it functioned, um, uh, who will sit down, commission research, analyse research, and really see what, in the future, a UK internal market needs to look like. Clearly, some of them, and even the UK government acknowledges this, are probably in, reser in reserved uh, areas, like food geographical indications and state aid, which they themselves have identified. But even if the, the UK government can identify areas that are within reserved powers, an independent body might identify quite a few more if they were actually conceptually thinking about what would be a good internal market. So I think from our perspective, even, even in a time of scarce resources, even in time of uncertainty, the first thing that a rational um, set of governments in the United Kingdom would do would be to decide, let's get, even now, a very small secretariat together who would have just this task at the moment of focusing on what the future internal market in the UK should be. Because actually, whether we're in the EU or not, these are issues that need to be considered. I mean, there is a, there's an EU market, but it doesn't necessarily translate identically into a UK market. The two things don't have to be identical. That's the way we've perhaps thought about things up to now, because it's been easy and convenient. But it doesn't have to be like that. There are important issues about how we do business within the United Kingdom that could be different from the way we do business within Europe. Uh, in any possible future political scenario, you know, even if uh, Scotland was independent, it might want to be in an internal market with the United Kingdom or the, or the remainder of the United Kingdom. So I don't think that the conceptual work that would be done by such a body would be wasted in whatever scenario develops. It would be useful work and therefore worth investing even at a time when everybody's stretched. <laughs> OK, that's helpful. But what I'm going to do is... I'm going to, for the next discussion session, I'm going to accelerate the area that Adam was going to be in, which is around the institutional governance, and bring that forward, since we've introduced that now. But before we get to that, um, Daphne and Jonathan both want to make a point. Yeah, if I can come in. Thank you, convener. Um, just one quick point in terms of the, the issue of principles and process. I think uh, Scottish Environment Link would echo the points that were just made by uh, Professor Paul Beaumont in terms of the need for a clear process that is transparent and uh, involves stakeholders. Um, on the, the issue of the types of principles that ought to be guiding kind of uh, common frameworks, um, I just want to note that there was an effort initially for the UK governments to come together and develop uh, a future sort of policy paper for the environment, and this was actually being led by the Scottish government. Uh, but obviously it seems that this has been maybe put aside because of other priorities, be it legislative of other or others. Um, and so we would have found that exercise very useful in terms of even the legislative bills that are coming on right now. So things like the EU environmental principles, solutions to governance gap, some of these are really joint problems, so we ought to be looking at how we can develop them, uh, develop solutions rather to them. And those solutions might be different in the different jurisdictions, but there's definitely an element of coming together to address those issues. Thank you, Daphne. Jonathan? Um, obviously, the question being asked is, is it Initially, in this theme, one is in relation to the, the UK internal market, and what, what, what do we understand and mean by that? And I, I'd just like to make the, the clear point from the start that, in the agricultural context, at least, um, we don't we don't play on a level playing field to begin with. Um, we have four different settlements of the common agricultural policy already across the United Kingdom, and we do things in a very different way in Scotland than, say, for England, Wales, and, and Northern Ireland. Uh, but arguably, we do play to the same rules just about. And I say just about, uh, because again, there are variations in some of the rules which are associated with the, the policy measures uh, that uh, Scotland 
operates uh, as opposed to England, Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, so the internal market, uh, I think there is a very important question around that that, that is rightly been raised by Professor Keating and, and others. Um, level playing field is what we all aspire to in some ways, uh, but nevertheless, the level playing field doesn't exist in the first place. Um, my really clumsy analogy on this uh, is that we are on a, a, an uneven playing surface, but we're just about playing the same, to the same rules. However, it's a bit like saying putting a rugby league team against a rugby union team. Some of the rules are pretty much the same. Sorry for those who don't know anything about rugby. I'm lost <laughs> <laughs> so, so, some, of them, some of the rules are the same, but there are clear differences as well. Uh, and and how, would you, how would you determine a, a fair outcome in, in a game of rugby league versus rugby union? Impossible. Um, but nevertheless, that's where we are. I think the, the other point I'd like to make at this stage, which leads us into theme two, is we're talking about common frameworks. What we've always talked about as NFU Scotland is commonly agreed frameworks. Uh, so there's this concept of common frameworks and what should be included in those common frameworks. But to us... It's all been about the process to which you derive those common frameworks. So it's the commonly agreed aspect and the process and the governance behind that, I think, which is fundamentally important uh, to us as, a, as an organisation. And that kind of leads us into things that are happening now at Westminster in terms of things like the Agriculture Bill and where powers will reside or might reside with the Secretary of State for the UK uh, and how the devolved administrations fit into that and feed into that. And this very important difference between uh, consult with and consent from, and the two things being markedly different uh, in terms of the powers that the Secretary of State might hold in the longer term. Before we move on to the next area, Michael Keaton, can I just ask you to reflect on the internal market issue, because I know you covered that in your own paper, and as did Professor Heald, I think. But when you're doing that, if you could just let us know how, you, how definitive you think this list of 111 policy areas actually are, because it seems to me that they're not written down anywhere in legislation, as far as I'm aware, and therefore that 111 might well change as we as we progress. And indeed, the 24 areas which the two governments are discussing in a lot more in depth at this stage may well change as we move on. Yeah, the list seems to be derived from what happens at the moment, but of course things will change in the future. These are shifting policy fields, which is why, again, it makes it strange to nail this down to particular pieces of legislation rather than general principles. The internal market, in one sense, the, the, the UK government started talking about the single market, and then they realised that was an inappropriate analogy with the European single market, so they started talking about the internal market. In one sense, you could say that's been there since the uh, Treaty of Union, because that provides for, for free trade. But in a modern economy, maintaining market unification requires a great deal more than that about regulations, product standards, uh, about state aids, about uh, public procurement, which is a, a really big one, about what kinds of things might be thought to interfere with the market, about the boundary between things that are provided in the market and things that are provided as public services, which is highly controversial and very political. We know this has come up in regard to international trade agreements where the fear has been expressed that if you have semi-marketised sectors then you can't protect your public services, whether that's well-founded or not. It is something that has been <coughs> expressed. There's the link to environmental issues. Do we have to have common environmental standards for a, a single economic market? Probably to some extent uh, we do. Uh, uh, the issue of state aids has come up in re relation to agriculture. Johnny was just mentioning the Agriculture Bill, which allows the Secretary of State for DEFRA effectively to lay down what permissible aids will be through a, a, the mechanism of the World Trade Organization. And, wait, so so, so it, it has all kinds of ramifications. So I think it would be simpler to, at one point, sit down and think about what the single market amounts to in general. This is the way the EU does it. They don't have a list of 125 competencies. It is a principle. And then think, as Paul said, and I'm part of the same committee of the RSE, so I share parentage of, of this proposal, have somebody somewhere who can actually provide, do the homework 
on that, on, on these very complicated issues. Ultimately, many of these are matters of political judgment, uh, but, but at least we need to have some common base. And I, and I think rather than complicating or delaying matters, that would actually simplify matters, because then we could go to the 111 competences or whatever it is and measure them against some kind of common standard. It would also deal with the problem I raised earlier on, with four or five different intergovernmental mechanisms for dealing with this, a sing similar process or a similar set of standards against which to measure things. Uh, I understand that there is an intergovernmental discussion at the moment about what the single market means led by the Treasury, but that seems to be going in parallel to the discussion about individual competences. And I think it would be better to give priority to that one, uh, and then we know where, where we're heading and what the basic principles are. Thank you. I think that helps us lead quite nicely into the section on governance and enforcement and common frameworks, which Adam Tompkins was going to lead. So, Adam, do you just want to... Yeah, thanks, oh, convening. I, just, I think I just... Yeah, sure. Yeah, but yeah, can, I, can I just ask a question yeah, directly direct on what Professor Keating has just said before I, I, I kind of launch into governance and enforcement? Yeah, yeah, Is that yeah, right? Um, I, because what strikes me about this um, uh, um, argument that we've heard, both from Paul and from Michael, um, is that it might be seeking something which is not available. And I'm wondering if it's available anywhere, right? So uh, anybody who knows anything about comparative federalism knows the history of the American Constitution with regard to the changing nature of the Commerce Clause, which is, which is the provision of the US Constitution, which deals with precisely this question. To what extent is economic regulation required at the national level? And to what extent can it safely be le left to the states? And the answer to that question, both legally and politically, has changed massively over the course of the 200 years of the of the, of the US Constitution without the principle um, uh, which is articulated in the relevant provision of the Constitution having changed at all. So we've got a very clear principle, but the sands underneath that principle have shifted massively um, from, from, from time uh, to time. Um, so I, I just wonder whether the, the RSC or anybody else has looked at whether there are any kind of international comparators that we can go to and learn from uh, and, and learn from you know, other than just learning a lesson that, you know, while it might be nice to have a really clear principled understanding of what the UK's internal market is and what it requires, it's not actually possible. Because I have to say, from my understanding of comparative federalism, whether you look to the US, Canada or Australia, you know, the three leading common law jurisdictions of federalism in the English speaking world, the only lesson that you can draw from this is that what you're asking for is impossible. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> Um, you know, Adam makes a good point and, and, and wouldn't want to deny that at all. I think uh, the comparative evidence which you've already taken shows that it's very difficult and any further comparative research will show that it's very difficult. So I wasn't saying there was a magic bullet out there. What I'm saying is that actually um, that you need flexibility. I was about to make that, wanted to make that point anyway. No to we shouldn't be aiming for a level playing field. I mean, this is nonsense. I mean, there is not a level playing field in Europe. The single market is not based on a level playing field. That's a myth. Because much of, of, of the single market is based on a, a principle of minimum harmonisation. It's the only way it ever was achieved was when we shifted away from maximum harmonisation to minimum harmonisation. Now, this is precisely the sort of issue that needs to be dealt with by somebody. Which of these competences need maximum harmonisation and why? Which of these competences only need minimum harmonisation and why? And I can't answer that question, and I don't have the expertise across all these areas. I need somebody to do the work. We all need somebody to do the work, not the conceptual work of where the balance should be between the, the federal government and the states. No, that's an illusion. But on every particular area where you think there's an internal market issue, how much harmonization do you need to make the market work? How much do you not need? Now, we can debate that, and that's where you need a political element, but you also need the underlying analysis of the technical area to see what the reasons are why you might have minimum or, or maximum harmonisation, and then you can have a political debate about which is the right outcome, and that will change over time. So it's about creating a structure where you can have the proper political debate about where power should lie between the central government and the... the to use a bad word, regional governments. OK, that's, 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 it's, there's no magic bullet. And we're not claiming there is. We're saying you need institutions at least to try to tease out what the real issues are, rather than just you know, relying on people purely on a sectoral basis, jumping in deep. There's a need to jump in deep. We're not denying that. But somebody needs to also take the 
more conceptual approach and actually think okay. what the issues are. But that, but that's a very helpful set of clarifications, Paul. Thank you for that. And I think it's particularly important that we understand that what, what, what the, the ask here is for something which will necessarily have to be flexible. We're not seeking to ossify or you know, fossilise a particular you know, in a here and now conception of this is what needs to be reserved for all time, this is what needs to be devolved for all time, um, this is what needs to be shared and, and how, how it needs to be shared for all time. It, it is go as the market changes and as our re reaction to the market uh, changes, there's going to have to be a degree of flexibility in, 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 in this, which means that we're looking for very high level principles um, so that a lot of the work that can be done, which is very politically contentious, uh, can be done um, uh, un underneath the umbrella of, the, of those principles. So you keep saying, somebody needs to do this work and i want to get into that question right i want to get into the question of what kind of institutional architecture are we thinking about here what kind of institutional structure are we talking about here are we talking about courts are we talking about um uh, committees of civil servants that may meet behind closed doors um uh, in safe in the safe spaces the government say that they need to negotiate um, with each other are we talking about something a bit more transparent and open than that that might even involve parliamentarians um, or are we involving, or, or are we talking about um, uh, quangos and uh, you know NGOs and, uh, and, and experts of, 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 of in some shape or form, whether through think tanks or organisations such as the RSC or um, uh, government agencies? So the, there, there are you know three from the written evidence that we've received. There are three suggestions in particular or three questions in particular that kind of stem from that one is you know do do we need formally to adopt some kind of qualified majority voting um in in terms of un, in terms of you know uh, understanding and analyzing these problems to what extent do we think that common frameworks will require to be judicially enforced whether by the uk supreme court or by other courts and tribunals and to what extent can we as parliamentarians expect any imp any meaningful input at all into the policing um, of these essentially intergovernmental bits of machinery. So there's a lot there, but I'd be very interested in your views about the, you know, what kind of institutional architecture is it that we think we're looking for? Paul, before I come to you, I'll just try to get other, because uh, I know you, RSC have done some work on this, I'll try to pull out some other um, contributions. Michael, do you want to? Yeah, um, very interesting set of questions. Um, and if we can get the answer before 11.30, that would be great. Um, I, th I think, though, it's, it's important for us to acknowledge how difficult these things are. Um, a, the, the route from um, a, a, a form of unanimity to qualified majority voting um, is a long and hard route, uh, as we saw uh, through the, the Maastricht Treaty process. It's, it's not easy, and the subsequent changes to that, the evolution of qualified majority voting, it, it, it's quite difficult. And I, I, know, I know at least one party leader in Scotland who, when I mentioned that three-letter acronym QMV, said, over my dead body. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, I think I think we've got to uh, appreciate that that theoretically is is probably where one would land, but politically it might not be possible to achieve that in 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 uh, in the world in which we live. Um, what kind of people should be round the table? Well, we have consistently since the referendum spoken of this being a whole of governance project. Not a whole of government project, a whole of governance project, uh, and we've we've spoken. Uh, you have heard me in this uh, in this committee talk about uh, getting together uh, the governments, uh, the uh, uh, and uh, and in that I mean all levels of government, um, uh, getting together with uh, uh, those who have uh, expertise um, in terms of academia, uh, the. Uh, professional bodies, uh, civil society generally. Um, uh, these are important components in getting the right answer, getting an answer with which everyone can live, because if common frameworks are to mean anything, if they are to have the permanence which Adam Tompkins talks of, then they have to be rooted uh, in a general acceptance and not simply some kind of formalistic political acceptance, which then breaks down over time as uh, political uh, priorities change. 
Um, and so, therefore, I think that there is a role for uh, it, it, for parliamentarians, and I think that, that uh, um, uh, administrations, governments should not be the authors exclusively of these arrangements. Um, and, and that goes to an element of transparency. Uh, uh, the, the, the process of the JMC has been characterised by a lack of transparency generally. There's been more transparency in Scotland, much less transparency in Westminster. Uh, and, and I think that uh, until latterly, uh, when, uh, when David Liddington has taken uh, to, the, to the dispatch box. But I think we've got to get to a point where there is much more transparency in these arrangements. Uh, and I know that's a difficult thing for the administrations to deal with, um, because uh, the things can be said in a room without other people there, which cannot be said in a room with other people there. But those other people are key to finding the answer here. Uh, and so, therefore, I think that there is a role for parliamentarians. Um, I think that accountability demands that scrutiny requires uh, that role for parliamentarians. Uh, otherwise, we may end up with common frameworks which don't function properly. And in terms of um, uh, whether the decisions should, uh, should be judicially enforced, I, I, you may think this strange coming from a lawyer, but I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure that judicial um, intervention is uh, the, the, the best way, um, uh, although it has to be there as a, as a backstop. Um, uh, <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> All right, that, that, was a, that was a popular cultural reference convener, um, which... This morning I had two different conversations of people using the word backstop, and I've never heard them using it before. It's amazing how it's got into our language. Well, well, I, I want to see exactly where it comes from originally and what the translation is, but there we are. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah, I, th I think, um, I think uh, using the courts as, as a final arbiter is, is right. But in the uh, Memorandum of Understanding, uh, the 20, October 2013, uh, the joint... Uh, ministerial committee ha has the capability uh, of having a complaints process, which takes us to a, a group of civil servants. So that you can see where where the RSE um, is following in a respectable trail. Um, the question is, is it correct that uh, the civil servants then end up determining the arrangements which are made uh, by politicians and? I, I, there's something there which tells me even the most independent of civil servants, uh, processes of appointment, uh, are we talking really essentially about a, a royal commission of civil servants uh, to ensure their appointment? Uh, I, you know, there would be much more detail would be needed to be able to um, uh, sign up to the idea at this moment. Colin, Reid, I know you said in some of your stuff pre that, we've, that I've seen that you, that, about the role of parliaments, etc., Michael introduced that into that. Would you like to reflect on some of that well, at this stage? And then I'll come, come to Patrick and Lloyd. Yeah, I think in terms of the parliaments, it, over the years it was one of the big criticisms of the way in which EU negotiations were, hand, were handled, that the government minister went from London, from, from whatever capital, did a deal behind closed doors, and then it was just presented as a fait accompli, and the parliaments had very little input into often the negotiating position that was, was taken and the acceptability of the final, final output. Now, that was a political process. That's where you ended up because of the way the EU worked. I think people have aspirations to do something better that is more open, that is more accountable. But it is a real difficulty in trying to balance that because difficult compromises inevitably will have to be made, which may not all be palatable, and trade-offs do have wins and losses in any individual thing. I think. It's not going to be possible to have complete accountability and complete transparency because then every decision is going to have to go back to be approved by every different parliament and so on. That's a recipe for absolute for, for getting nowhere. But at the very least, announcements of what's going to be discussed, the possibility for some discussion of at least possible policy positions that are going to be embarked going in and then fully reporting on what's happened after. You can do something around those areas that that goes some of the way to solving what was identified as a big gap. I think you commented on some of this 
area as well, if I, if I remember correctly. So. Um, my background would be in utility regulation, uh, working in cross-border markets and cross-border business um, on the island of Ireland. And so we're quite used to spending a lot of time looking at EU directives and trying to understand what the implications would be for how we run a business. Um, and one of the things I think which is very important is that um, we want to avoid diversity and standards being used as barriers to trade or, or competition. Because if we're talking about an internal market, you have to be able to run a business in it. You have to understand why you should invest and what the risks are and what the potential rewards are. So I think it's, it's very important not just to look at the theoretical uh, mechanics of how it's done, but also the effect on, uh, on economic players. One of the, uh, or two things identified in the House of Commons report were about trust and lack of uh, deep and widespread understanding of devolution issues. And that's the reason that uh, I would have supported the idea of a single body which could build up expertise and become the go-to organisation whereby individual departments who want to produce some uh, frameworks could go for advice on process. It's uh, extremely important that there is transparency, not that everything is said necessarily in an open forum, but that the process allows for consultation so as people can point out where issues are different in different places, different people have different experiences and uh, and are able to bring a, a broader diversity of understanding to what should be in um, frameworks. So I think transparency of process uh, doesn't necessarily mean everything is done uh, in public. Governance uh, is important. And so people who are trying to work in a market need to understand what the root of legislation or whatever is from um, a policy idea through to legislation or uh, a directive equivalent. Um, so that's, it's really about um, people understanding what is being done, how it's being done, and being given the opportunity to provide meaningful feedback. Uh, the only thing about um, MOU versus legislation, etc., uh, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't have any opinion on that at all. But from experience, um, the single electricity market on the island of Ireland was set up on the back of uh, an intergovernmental, non-legally binding MOU. So I know it's possible for that mechanism to deliver. On the other hand, the intention to deliver an all-island gas market um, <laughs> crashed and burned. There didn't seem to be any um, top-down driver to make it happen. So I, I think it's very important that there is a framework to make sure that uh, outcomes are actually delivered. <coughs> Patrick? Um, thanks I, may, very I, much. I may have moved on a bit from where you were in terms no, of your I questions. No, I think it's still relevant. Um, I appreciate the, the, the suggestions and, and ideas that are coming forward. Um, I think it's important to remember, though, that we're not just engineering a rational system, uh, that there'll always be the potential for a situation where there is strong rational reason to have a, a common, coordinated, uh, UK-wide approach, and at the same time, sufficiently strong political disagreement about the direction of policy that both jurisdictions or multiple jurisdictions within the UK think that their divergence is more important to them than the, the advantages of a, of a shared approach. Um, in relation to the, the, the architecture of, of institutions, um, the suggestion, well, the, the comparison that I would like to, to make is with the UK Climate Change Committee. Now, that's an advisory body, not a regulator. It doesn't have enforcement powers. Uh, but the, the two jurisdictions, Scotland and UK, each uh, passed climate change legislation. The UK one came first, set up and defined the, the advisory role of the, the, the CCC. The Scottish legislation then gave ministers the power either to designate a body for, the, for its advisory function, or to create a separate Scottish one. And that second power has never been used after nearly a decade of the CCC performing its function both in relation to the Scottish context and in relation to the UK context where 
UK ministers have UK-wide responsibilities but also devolved powers in England and Wales only or in England only. Um, now, that could have been a real mess, uh, particularly because there are differences of, of policy on some of this. But I would make the case that the voluntary nature of that relationship is what created the advantage and, and the potential for uh, a relationship where not only the CCC has an incentive to take Scotland seriously and take account of political differences or policy differences, but also where the Scottish Government, and with the agreement of the Scottish Parliament, has been content to keep that body as the, the UK-wide advisory body as well as the Scottish advisory body. Now, there are, of, of course, differences with a, a regulator or a body that has enforcement powers in relation to government. But is that general idea that the voluntary nature of an arrangement, the non-binding nature of an arrangement, could actually result in a stronger outcome rather than a looser one? Lloyd, I know you wanted in again. I hope it's not moved on too far. Paul, I'm going to come back to you at some stage, Paul, because Adam actually probably addressed his, some, a lot of his questions at the beginning to you specifically, but you've heard a lot of contributions round about. It would be a nice place to, to come back to. Lloyd. Um, thanks, Convener. I, I'll come back to the Climate Change Committee in a moment, but I, I wanted to make some general points about uh, governance. And, and first of all, I think I would strongly support the view that this is about govern, governance, not governments. It, it's, it's about governments as part of wider governance, if um, that's not too much of a tongue twister. Um, uh, and there is a need, I think, is, is generally acknowledged for better intergovernmental relations. Um, it, it's an area where, as environmental organisations, we hadn't had much experience in the past before uh, the last couple of years. And one of the things that uh, we did was ask the Institute for Government to, to produce a report about uh, this in relation to environmental matters. And that's, that's referenced in our evidence. And I would certainly commend that report uh, about uh, the, the, the various um, failings, as we see it, from about uh, in terms of the uh, the way in which the JMCs work, and including some proposals for how it how it may be better. And I completely agree with. Um, I think it was Ian highlighted the need for process, and as part of that process, I think as a stakeholder. Uh, we and, and probably business as well uh, think that transparency and proper stakeholder engagement in these in these matters is a is a key part of that governance. And I think uh, in terms of the various areas, obviously that it's about uh, intergovernmental process. It's about interparliamentary process, scrutinising the intergovernment process. Um, governments obviously have officials or agencies working for them, uh, but it shouldn't be beyond the wit of man to create some kind of uh, um, institutional arrangement to support the intergovernmental uh, organisation, some form of secretariat that is responsible not to any one of the individual governments, but to the collective, um, uh, some kind of secretariat of the joint ministerial joint governmental process. Uh, and uh, uh, I think that has happened in, in previous Anglo-Irish agreements, for instance. So I think there are ways of doing it. And I, th I think the key thing that, that such a secretariat could do from the point of view of stakeholders is ensure that that process and transparency and stakeholder engagement and in-depth analysis is, is uh, uh, available to the governments who are making the decisions. At the moment, the governments meet and the communiques just simply say they met and they discussed X, Y, and Z. Um, and uh, the support and the information that's provided for those discussions appears to be lacking. And the uh, organisations affected, whether it's businesses or NGOs or citizens, etc., have no idea how they can influence or even feed in views. Um, I think the key thing I would say is that it applies, in a sense, whatever happens constitutionally, whether, it, whether we're talking about uh, Brexit or whether we're talking about uh, an independent Scotland or different models of devolution. All of the principles of better intergovernmental governance apply irrespective of long-term political constitutional decisions. 
Uh, I think, um, uh, just finally, uh, on the Climate Change Committee, the Climate Change Committee, I, I agree with Patrick's analysis of how it has worked well in relation to the climate change advice. But I think one of the key areas of governance that environmental bodies are concerned about goes beyond that, uh, beyond advice. Uh, it's about the uh, implementation and it's about the uh, regulation and enforcement mechanisms. And I know that the Scottish Government are committed to consult on that before the end of the year. Um, and uh, Westminster Government in relation to England and reserve matters are have had a consultation and are deliberating how to act. But I think the possibility of, uh, in other areas as well as advice, having a joint or, 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 or agreeing to operate through institutions that share support, that may be a better way of putting it than uh, 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 it, it enables a greater transparency and understanding amongst uh, stakeholders, I think. So I, I would commend the Climate Change Committee as a model to explore whether or not that can be applied in different areas. Paul and then Neil. Yeah, thank you, convener. Yes, um, well, Adam, a long time ago, asked a lot of questions. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to remember to answer them all, but I'll, I'll try and deal with the, 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 what I can remember. Um, I think the RSE position relates to the development of policy, the development of the common frameworks. That's where we've reached a kind of agreed position. So I can speak to that. Other things then I'll speak more personally to some of your um, questions. So in terms of development of policy, I think what we are suggesting, the RSE is suggesting, is indeed to have an independent secretariat that would be made up essentially of civil servants with experience from Northern Ireland, from Wales, from Scotland and from the UK appointed to then speak, as it were, for the United Kingdom in the abstract, not the United Kingdom government, and they would um, bring that range of expertise to the, to the table, which is perhaps lacking at the moment. Nobody's brought that expertise together. So that's point one. That grouping having been established, probably pretty small at first because, you know, let's not over-exaggerate the, the significance of it. You know, I think um, public expenditure priorities and all the rest of it is probably going to be a relatively small body. It, but it should have some budget, shared cost of the budget across the UK government in an appropriate way, not for me to decide, um, you know, each of the, the players contributing to their budget. Once they've got that budget, they have independence in how they, how they use it, but they would be, I think, um, free to commission some research um, which, you know, would go through the usual procurement process to get hopefully the best people to produce good research. The Secretariat would have to decide what the priorities are for that research. Some of it would be conceptual, some of it would be very technical, detailed stuff. Um, transparency is a key. How do you, how do you have transparency? I think the, the, the key thing for the Secretariat is to publish all the research that comes in, all the, 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 the papers that they're uh, producing uh, on, on the, the broader issues, you do need a degree of um, privacy from, from my experience of negotiating both in the international sphere and in the European sphere. You need, you need areas where everything isn't in the public domain, and I think that's just sensible that you can have free and frank discussion at a certain level before you go into the public domain. So I don't think transparency should be confused with everything being in the, in, done in the public domain. I think that leads to bad decision making rather than good decision making. So transparency is about um, making as much as you, as you can make available publicly so that you have an informed debate. Um, but some of those debates need to be in private. Then you have transparency so that people can feed in. And this is where uh, Lloyd is correct. The, the way you get good governance is if the people who really know about the subject that's being discussed have inputted all the relevant data. If you don't ask them, you don't get it. Now, the advantage of an independent secretariat is that hopefully they will see their role as the Commission and the European Union does when it does its job well. It doesn't always do so, but when it does its job well, it really does seek out all the relevant expert input before it makes its proposal. So again, you would see an independent secretariat who would, at the early stages, be getting all this data before it makes its 
proposal as to how to deal with some specific aspect of, of a common framework. And so it's that kind of learning from the best, if you like, of the European Union, whilst not just mimicking it. Um, now, that brings me beyond, I think, what the RSE has said to other issues that Adam has asked. Well, um, should you have qualified majority voting or um, consensus? I've worked with both, both within the European Union, um, and, and I've worked with consensus in an international environment. My personal preference is consensus. I'll be quite frank about that. Um, I, I, I think that in a, in a, at least initially, and for the reasons Michael mentioned, even in the EU, it had to be on the basis of consensus initially. So at least initially, this framework within the United Kingdom, in my opinion, should, personally speaking now, should be based on consensus. And um, therefore, if you don't have political consensus, you don't have a common framework. You, you, you go back to whatever the, the legislative position is under the current constitutional settlement. Which, of course, does run a risk. I realise that if the UK um, government and parliament behave badly, they can upset that settlement by driving through legislation without consent uh, on the basis that it's just a convention. Now, of course, again speaking personally, <laughs> I would say that that would be a, a disaster from the point of view of the long-term United Kingdom constitutional settlement. So one would hope, and indeed, speaking personally, pray that the UK government wouldn't get into the habit of breaking the convention. And it would only be a very rare thing, and that the normally provision would stick. But if it didn't, then the whole thing wouldn't, wouldn't really work in the long run. That, that would undermine the, the, whole, the, whole, um, the whole system. But if, if you have a sensible use of the, um, the current constitutional settlement, Common frameworks can be, I think, developed purely on the basis of consensus, and you rely on the normal operative rules if there isn't consensus. But it shouldn't be seen as an excuse for the UK government to dominate the agenda because they've got the, the trump card. If the UK government gets into that frame of mind, it will, it will undermine the whole system. Now, um, do we need courts? Well, <laughs> Good question. Um, I think, again, all the examples are if, if cooperative federalism, if we want to use that dangerous word that the Germans use, if it's to work, it works, as the name implies, on the basis of cooperation rather than on the basis of legal frameworks where you fight it out in the courts. So I would say, again, if this is to move forward in a way that will be good for the United Kingdom as a whole, it should be on the basis of consensus and then people making things work, like the All-Ireland um, uh, electricity market, making it work because there's a common interest in making it work, not because some court tells you you've got to do it. Uh, courts are not the best people to determine these questions, in my opinion. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a parliamentary sovereignty guy at heart, as probably Adam knows, and, and I, I think the politicians need to be making the, the decisions, not, not courts. Um, so what role for parliaments? That's the last part of this question, I think. Yes, there has to be a role for the parliaments. I think the parliament should be the ones that try to make sure that the independent secretariat um, does its job properly, that it doesn't get captured by any particular interest or interests, any particular lobby groups. It, it does actually maintain an overall perspective on those difficult p political questions where you're balancing different interests, whether it be the, the environment, for example, is one very strong lobby groups, very well represented in this committee, by the way. It's interesting, isn't it? It's, it's got its act together. There are other interests out there that haven't got their act together so well. Politicians need to be careful not just to listen to the strongest lobby voice, nothing against the environment, by the way, but, you know, there are other, there are other ba balancing factors in a, in a single market. Where's the business voices today? Where are the business voices? Honestly, and, and, and COSLA. COSLA is excellent evidence, but where are they today? So, look, I'm just saying that's the job of the politicians in the end, to ensure that the different vested interests are properly balanced in making final decisions. That's why it's not the Secretariat that makes the decisions, the Secretariat just creates a framework. The other good thing about the Secretariat, sorry, I'm going on and on, but the problem with the JMC, um, some of our members have been involved in it, and the problem with the JMC is it, it doesn't automatically meet, it doesn't have clear agendas, it doesn't have clear outcomes. If you have the system we're suggesting, the advantage is the Secretariat makes sure there's regular meetings of the ministers, 
they make sure that those meetings are not just a talking shop, but actually are dealing with something concrete, and there should be outcomes from those meetings. Yeah, that's a whole different ball game to what the JMC is and has been. Well, thank you very much. Um, you, you raised issues about who, who was here and who wasn't here. I can assure you that the, the variety of people were asked from a, for, no, no, but just so it's on the record, a variety of people were asked from across a number of sectors and for various reasons um, couldn't be here today. Um, Neil, on Adam's question, we've obviously heard a lot about the need for a, you know, a new independent secretariat, greater transparency and scrutiny. Um, Members will be, uh, will be aware that those are proposals set out uh, by the Welsh Government as part of the UK Council, their proposal for a UK Council of Ministers. Um, and I know we've touched on some of the issues around qualified majority voting, but I would just welcome you know, any further contributions specifically touching on the Welsh Government's proposal for a UK Council of Ministers, because as we've you know, discussed, timescales are tight. Um, and, and there is obviously a, a proposal here from the Welsh Government that, that, that is, I think, worthy of, of discussion and debate. Uh, Professor Michael Keaton to just pick up on that point as he makes his contribution at this stage, and then we'll need to move on to some other areas. Yeah, correct. First, just pick up a point that, that Adam mentioned earlier on about the single market or the internal market not being a fixed principle. Of course not. It's a living principle. It changes over time. The European market changes over time, and that's where we need to have a mechanism. It changed with the welfare state. It will change with international agreements and so on. So, uh, again, that's one reason not to write in these 111 competence or whatever it is these days as the solution. The solution has got to be something that's open to social change. On the Welsh proposal. Uh, I, I'm one of the few people around the various tables at which I've sat uh, that actually likes the Welsh Government's proposals, because at least it provides some kind of ultimate, I was going to say backstop, <laughs> <laughs> tiebreaker, where you get conflict. Because in most of these issues, I think we're going to get consensus. Uh, some issues, we won't. Issues like public procurement and so on can become quite contentious. Uh, and therefore, as a last resort, it would be useful to have a system in which the UK government cannot always play the Trump card. And that will have a feedback effect. Knowing that it can't get its own way all the time, it can't play that Trump card, the UK government will be obliged to engage seriously in uh, discussion with it. And so probably we don't have to vote. The UK, the EU, the Council of, of, of the European Union doesn't vote on most issues because they know that the voting is there and that provides an incentive to uh, uh, agree. So I, I think we've got to bring in the question of power. That's, that's, that's really what I'm saying here. It, it is a power game, ultimately. Uh, or the other thing that, that we discussed in various places, including in the RSE, is where does England come in? Mm. And if there is a UK Council of Ministers, there must be an English minister representing England as well as the UK. <laughs> And this applies to a lot of things we're saying. Will England be bound to common frameworks, given it's both the English government and the UK government are, are the same thing? That's important. It's not just important for England. It's important for the whole of the UK. It's important for Scotland that, that, that there should be a separate English presence. And so we know who, is, who, who are the partners in, in this, this negotiation. We've got to do that without resolving the question of English government, because we're not going to resolve it. That's, that's a bigger, separate issue that's not going to be resolved tomorrow. But, but within the frameworks argument, we need to think about England. Thank you. I'm going to move on to, to, to James now, because actually we just moved into, quite neatly from what Michael, Michael said, into issues about negotiation, effectively. But just before, you do, before I do so, you, you mentioned the issue of power, and I think that's a, a quite a, an important aspect of what we're discussing. But so is culture. And one of the things that struck me in the most recent visit that this committee members had to uh, the European Union to visit to talk to Canadians, Norwegians, Germans and Swiss, was every time we got into discussion about conflict resolution, they were shocked at us. Because actually they look at it the other way around, about how you can find solution rather than looking at about how you can, what dispute mechanisms need to be in place to resolve the issues. And it was quite an interesting cultural difference between how we are approaching it currently in the UK and compared with the way we do. And we seem to be putting always how we resolve conflict first before actually sitting down and talking about it when actually the conflict might not exist in the first place. I thought it was quite an interesting learning point for me. And that's all about clever negotiation. So, James, we'll hand over to you to, to the next section. That's a that. very pertinent introduction to, the, to this uh, section, convener, uh, which looks at, I think everybody 
understands the need that if this is to work properly, we need a, a clear process for negotiation, agreement and implementation of common frameworks. And a lot of the a lot of the issues here have already been uh, discussed in the, the previous uh, section, but um, and it was really interesting to listen to uh, Paul in terms of the you know the different forums for resolution, you know consensus, uh, qualified majority voting, or courts, uh, and I think convener kind of brought it all to the fore in the sense that when we did go to Brussels. Uh, the key to all this uh, is, is really about relationships between the the UK government and the devolved governments. And when we spoke to people from other countries, um, there was a different culture. There was a culture of people got everyone sitting down to discuss the issues and to try and seek solutions. And even when there were uh, you know big disagreements, they understood that they needed to try and, and resolve the issues and, and come up with solutions. It's not unreasonable to say that the current position in the UK is that we we don't have that culture, um, and you know we don't have a in, in some instances we don't have a kind of starting position of trying to find a, a joint solution. So I suppose my question is, how do we change the the, the way we organise the relationships, or the way we 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 have a relationships between the UK government and the de devolved? Uh, governments in order that we can then uh, achieve this objective of uh, you know, achieving common frameworks and have a clear process for negotiation, agreement and implementation. How do we change that culture? Yeah, how do we reset this relationship? I think that's what... Ian. Thank you. Uh, I from experience, my view would be that uh, if you have uh, an effective process, then you can avoid issues of trust and conflict arising. So that's heading it off at the pass, if you like. Um, for example, the um, intergovernmental MOU setting up the uh, single electricity market in Ireland um, defined how the market would work, but it also said the governance body would have three people from one regulator, three people from another regulator, and also a representative from someplace else entirely. Uh, and that has worked very well. So I think you, you need to look at the, um, the design of the process to try and say in what areas might uh, conflict arise, and then try and find a mechanical solution to try and avoid that. Um, I, I think one of the areas where uh, people sometimes have suspicions of one another is when they feel that the scope of what is being asked for is starting to creep, um, so as it looks like there's more um, power or more um, uh, regulation or, or something being brought in and imposed, and people feel uncomfortable about that. So I think it's very important to define the scope of, what, um, of what's being discussed and what can be discussed. And when you look at um, a, a European directive, for example, it always starts off with something like, um, this is based on the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union article, whatever. So that comes up front that says, here is the authority that we have for doing it. And I think the, the overarching um, agreement, framework, whatever uh, structure that has, should actually have something that defines the scope very clearly so that uh, everybody understands that some things will be uh, ultra vires and other things are part of what's already been agreed. Colin. I think in terms of resetting the way negotiations and discussions go, the point that Michael's made I think is hugely important. That is the presence of a separate English voice at these issues, because dealing with colleagues in various English bodies and so on, they're perfectly willing to think about devolution and they're very happy to have people talking about, well, that's different in Scotland, that's different in Wales and so on, but it's just not part of their consciousness the same way as it is to people up here. And by having UK government bodies that are whole UK, GB, England and Wales, England, depending on different 
matters often very finely divided within particular subject areas. I think that's, that really makes things difficult. And if it was much clearer that in the discussions you were having to talk about the four nations coming together, that would help things a lot. The bigger problems are obviously political, macro-political issues. There are always going to be disagreements about those. But the, raising the awareness that we are talking about needing to reach settlements, agreements for all four parts of the UK, I think would be important, and having a separate English voice is crucial to that. And how, how do we go about that, creating that separate voice? I think it's possibly beyond the powers of this committee. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but let's generate some ideas. Have you got any ideas of how that, how, how that might be, be, uh, enable it to come to flower? I think it's, it's, it's very hard. I think you may... You've got to somehow try to... It may be trying to persuade the UK government of the advantages of separating out their role as UK as having a sort of overarching role compared to the dealing with the with the details. But that involves, you know, it would involve extra money, a certain amount of duplication. I can't see any great appetite for it at, at present. But in the ideal world, I think in terms of resetting resetting the way negotiations happen, that is a, a crucial element. I was rather cruel to you there, Colin. Yeah, I remember that, <laughs> Michael. Um, uh, uh, English votes for English laws, um, uh, and uh, you know, I think if if one went to uh, if one went back to the standing orders of the House of Commons uh, when uh, English votes for English laws was uh, set up, uh, you would find there that the word devolution uh, occur and devolved powers uh, occurs frequently. And I remember when those debates were going on because I participated in them to a certain extent. Um, uh, in, uh, uh, I think there was an evidence session before a committee of the House of Lords. Um, uh, the, the, the whole point is that um, English votes for English laws applies where the law would be a devolved law under the devo devolved systems of either Northern Ireland, Scotland or Wales. Um, uh, and that, I think, is, is where we've got to, to remind ourselves that there is already a structure which takes into account laws applicable to England as a component of the United Kingdom, but in its own right. Uh, and that, that, I think, convener, is where, where I, I would guide people to, to look. Um, uh, because uh, if, if we get to that point of understanding, uh, then it would be the House of Commons bereft of its... Uh, um, uh, or, or consisting only of its English MPs, who would then nominate someone to participate uh, uh, for for the English voice. Angela. So, building on that, I had wondered um, if there was some learning, and the panel might have views on this specifically, about how the British Irish Council works. Now, obviously, the, the English voice is absent there, but you have, you know, arrangements. Uh, where all the devolved administrations participate, UK government are obviously uh, present as well, and you know there's a kind of structure and format around that with bilaterals, you know, feeding into plenary sessions. And then I'll go to Jonathan. Yeah, you asked the question about how we overcome the the lack of of trust, and and that's clearly a fundamental question. So the the first thing is, I think, to create the independent secretariat, which then becomes. The hopefully the the, the 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 container of trust in the sense that if that's a body that we 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 say should command the the confidence of each of the of the relevant players, so it should command the confidence of the UK government, of the Scottish government, the, the Welsh government, and the, the non-Irish executive if it's functioning. Um, they they all should then have some confidence that this group of civil servants with different backgrounds are at least honestly preparing the ground for work. So if you take a bottom-up approach rather than a top-down approach, from my experience, again in Europe and in the world, if you start with the people who actually know what they're doing, and they do all the hard graft, the politicians only get involved when there's a few problems left. That's the way the EU works. It's also the way international negotiations work. I've done both. So what happens is the people who actually have the expertise slave away for a very long time, you know, months, years, on technical details. They, they 
they have the trust in each other because they're all experts. They get to know each other. They sort of, you know, work together. They build the consensus gradually. And then they need some political leverage, usually at the very end, to, to tease out the few remaining issues which are more political. And if there can be an agreement, there's an agreement. If there isn't, there isn't. But, you know, that's the point. You build it from the bottom. You don't start with the politicians sitting around saying, this is an intractable, difficult problem. How are we going to solve it? Sorry, they don't have the expertise to do that for a start. And, 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 and nor the political will necessarily to try to do it at the start. So the real answer is, is, is to be much more systematic, instrumental, start from technical work through, but also with proper foundational, as we said earlier, foundational context for that technical work, so you know what you're trying to achieve in a broader context. Well, once you've let, laid those foundations through your secretariat, through then some kind of agreement that the politicians can reach about the varies, you know, you're right, what the overall scope of this endeavour is, um, then it's up to trusting that kind of properly prepared work which has gone through consultation with stakeholders. Again, I would point out when the EU works well, <laughs> I've seen this, the UK is very good because generally the UK comes to, uh, to negotiations with a carefully prepared position which is based on extensive consultation which has gone through a lot of stakeholder input. This is not true of every government in the EU, I can point out, who often come just with civil servants' own personal agenda or their political agenda not with a carefully teased out, carefully crafted position that reflects strong um, stakeholder input. So again, if you want to learn how to do it well, it is indeed to do it on the basis of each of the entities having their stakeholders advising them on what's needed for them. So in the agricultural field, Scotland needs to be heavily advised by Scottish stakeholders giving the Scottish position so that the Scottish voice is properly taken account of in reaching some kind of common framework. Um, I'm going to tee Daphne up for later because I want to come to stakeholders engagement and I know S. E. Link have said something specifically about it but before we get there I still have first of all Willie. Yep. Bruce thanks there's a there's a good example in place at the moment and uh, forgive me for giving a plug to the British Irish Parliamentary Assembly which I bet most of members have probably never heard of. It's a great assembly of parliamentarians from the UK, uh, from Doyle Erin, devolved ad administrations and Crown dependencies, and, and, and it works really well. It was set up in 1990, convener, principally to assist the peace process, but the point of it is that, that they meet collectively. And there are di extremely diverse views on that assembly, but the good thing that comes about from it is that everyone gets the opportunity to, to share, and believe it or not, we actually agreed unanimously a, a motion in Brexit over the weekend, so it can be done if people can get together in some kind of common forum to achieve these kinds of purposes. So perhaps maybe that's a, a model for the, for the future that we could have a wee look at. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. Jonathan? I was just going to pick up on uh, Paul's points in particular and you know, just expressing some support about I think we have an opportunity here, whether it's through the sort of um, independent secretariat or, or some sort of council of ministers. I think one of the biggest problems we've got in terms of how we break this culture and trust issue that we're talking about here is that in the past, particularly when it's come, come to big, big decision-making processes around the common agricultural policy, that it's been the UK as the member state who's had the one and only seat around the table at the council of ministers. So it's always been the UK... Uh, Secretary of State for, uh, for DEFRA, particularly uh, leading uh, on those particular issues. And that has always caused attention and an issue, particularly for Scotland, when the discussion might have been revolved about less favoured area support, for example, or coupled support, which are, are clearly uh, very much uh, of major interest to Scottish agriculture, but aren't so for particularly English agriculture uh, and so on. So and I'm sure it's happened in other spheres around fishing policy and all the rest of it, it we, we must have an opportunity here somewhere to say, well, you know, that, that's, that was in the context of the UK being a member state of the European Union. We've now got the context of the devolved administrations being part of, the, of a, a, a united kingdom and, and looking at how an internal market operates and the common frameworks that are acquired. So 
I think, you know, from a personal point of view, having a separation between the UK government and then four devolved administrations, including an English uh, administration, is really quite important. Uh, and that providing some sort of council of ministers, with the UK effectively being, uh, if you like, the commission in, in that particular role. But arguably that role obviously is, is quite political because it's elected, it's a government, uh, but that, that might be where Paul's suggestion of an independent secretariat comes in and actually provides all that solid groundwork and engagement stuff. And I think, just to finish off, the point about proper input from stakeholders from, from devolved regions has always been a frustration. Uh, and this actually, if we get this right, actually gives us a, could give us a stronger voice in, in those sort of uh, negotiations and getting to the right outcome. And I think it's absolutely right to raise the question, why do we start from the point of conflict resolution? Why don't we find the common interests and common goals first? And, and then, then some issues might fall out of that. So we need to turn that on its head a bit, so I agree with that. OK, thank you, Jonathan. Now, I've got other people who want to come in, but, but, but I'm anxious before we finish this particular section, we all should talk about there is no Council of Ministers yet, there is no Secretariat yet, and therefore... How are we going about involving stakeholders currently in the development of common frameworks? So, Daphne, can I ask you just to deal with that so we can get some of that explored as well? And Lloyd, I'm going to come to you after that, and I'll let you pick up on some of that as well as make your other contribution as well. Thank you, Convener. In some ways, I just want to highlight that this is not about reinventing the wheel. I completely you know, agree, and I think Scottish Environment Link members would completely agree with the points made by Paul earlier. But if we compare that... Um, you know, great process to what is happening currently within the UK. We know that there are JMC discussions about principles that should underpin common frameworks, common resources being one of the principles that um, are part of this. And in parallel, we know that civil servants, experts in their fields, um, are doing the deep dives. But we have not seen the outcome of these processes. And I think seeing that and being able to comment on that and deliberate on those on a truly UK-wide basis would be a very helpful um, thing to do at this point. I think it would help resolve potentially some of the impasses or clarify a lot of the, the areas of potential concern. And that is why we have been calling for sort of a true engagement on this on this topic uh, from all the UK governments. And in some ways, those UK-wide discussions about frameworks, how do we go ahead with a different EU legislation coming back to sort of domestic law, we are replicating those discussions internally within the ENGO community. And we have found solutions. We have found principles for working together and what would make most sense in terms of environmental aims. So from our point of view, Yes, perhaps we do need a better intergovernmental process for the UK going forward, but it doesn't mean that at the moment there is no, no route forward um, in the interim. Thank you, Daphne. Lloyd. Um, I would endorse everything Daphne said, but I was going to come in and comment on Angela and Willie's point about the British Irish Council and the British Irish Interparliamentary Forum. Um, uh, because I, I think that's very important, because <coughs> if you think back to why uh, uh, um, environmentalists are interested in common frameworks, it boils down to the issue of the environment being that kind of cross-border issue uh, that I referred to right at the beginning. And, you know, for different parts of the UK, we abut different parts of other other jurisdictions, the Republic of Ireland being one, but equally the Isle of Man and the Channel Islands, uh, who are all involved in those processes. And some common frameworks will need to be a mixture of all jurisdictions or some jurisdictions. Um, I mean, and, uh, you know, from an from, uh, Irish point of view, there, there, there are many reasons for the, 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 the Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland to, to work together on environmental issues as well as energy markets and so on. Um, but, you know, fishermen in the southwest of Scotland will obviously have a very interest in, in working with the Isle of Man as well as Northern Ireland. So, you know, inclusion of the Isle of Man in, in these di discussions is important. And it just does seem to me, I think I would um, completely endorse uh, Paul's point about the Secretariat working from the bottom up, because all of those different relationships could be identified and mapped out by a Secretariat for offering up to the, the kind of um, political 
masters that they have and, and, and so on. And, and uh, whilst um, we would want to uh, include all of those, uh, what I would call um, uh, the, the English-speaking jurisdictions of the British Isles, um, we also need to carry on in working with the other EU and non-EU jurisdictions around those, you know, whether that be through building relationships with, or obviously the, the, the EU through whatever agreement um, we reach, uh, as Anthony was describing earlier, but equally with, with Norway and Iceland, perhaps through the Nordic Council or whatever. So I think these kind of inter-jurisdictional arrangements, whether they be common frameworks or others, are important in, in, in all dimensions, you know, and I think we need to think about some things being simply the four jurisdictions of what is the UK at the moment, but equally we need to think about the, the, um, the issue for re the reason why we are having it, you know, so in a sense, the, from an environmental perspective, we think we need these cross-border arrangements because the environment is cross-border, energy is a similar one, and there are other areas, and that leads to different groupings of jurisdictions needing different solutions, and I think a secretariat could map out that, those kind of challenges. Michael. I thinking when Jonathan was speaking about the Concordat on um, coordination of European policy matters, and um, yes, it is true uh, that uh, it, there is a lot of UK ministerial involvement in that, but the Concordat goes to try to create a mechanism where um, uh, the devolved administrations can uh, put their points into the pot and that an agreed position can be reached. And certainly in justice and Home Affairs Councils, I think uh, Scottish ministers have sat uh, representing the UK view. I think also in, uh, in uh, law officer meetings as well, uh, European law officers. Uh, so so I, I think there, there is, that is a basis upon which to build. Um, now, I'm not in a position to say that the Law Society would approve the RSE proposal at the moment because we haven't considered it in those terms. But um, what I can say is that uh, if we have no agreement uh, on the 29th of March 2019, then we will actually have to have some form of common uh, frameworks in place at that date. So um, uh, uh, the comfort uh, of being able to create uh, this, uh, uh, I hesitate to use the word Byzantine, uh, but I will because I don't believe that the Byzantine emperors did everything badly. Um, uh, but um, uh, uh, but um, uh, the, the idea of creating this structure um, uh, within the, that time frame is fine, but the comfort of thinking that we're going to have a withdrawal agreement which will give us until the 31st of December uh, 2020 to create these uh, common frameworks, which is a much more realistic proposition. Um, uh, I, th I think we've got to bear in mind that the issue is now, and th that prudence dictates that we are prepared for the 29th of March, not that we rely on the comfort of a hoped-for withdrawal agreement. Which, might I say, takes us back to the idea of the joint committee under the withdrawal agreement, uh, and the specialised committees and uh, that mechanism which Jonathan had identified under the Concordat could easily be transported over to apply uh, in the context of the structures which the withdrawal agreement uh, anticipates. And b bearing in mind what Anthony was talking about in terms of the political agreement for the future relationship, uh, which uh, one would hope to... to, uh, to uh, be part of the result of the negotiations which will go on. Uh, then there is there the governing body and the joint committee as well. Um, uh, and uh, you can see how that corresponds to commission, the council of ministers. Uh, and uh, the, the, so these, these things are never going to go away. Uh, and we do have to come up with something which uh, governments, uh, bearing in mind that they are the primary actors here, have to come up with something which we can all uh, be exposed uh, consulted upon, which we can hopefully approve. Well, hopefully some of the discussion we're having here today, Michael, can stimulate some of that activity in, in governments to create some of this forward movement. And certainly, it was a very sobering moment when you reminded us that it might be from March next year. 
Um, I need to move on to the final topic, which is about funding arrangements for common frameworks. And Emma Harper, MSP, will start off that discussion in this topic area. OK, thank you, convener. Good morning, everybody. It's been really helpful listening to everybody's contributions so far. And I am interested in funding arrangements for future common frameworks. And in our briefing papers that were submitted, there was uh, the Brexit and Environment Academics uh, all observed that the guaranteed funding at an appropriate level would be necessary to ensure long-term effectiveness of any government arrange arrangements or governance arrangements. And I'm interested about the impact that Brexit will bring further complexities to the devolved financing system, partly as a result of the differences in per capita funding across the UK's four nations to achieve the same policy results. And they highlight the risk that one outcome to guard against is given financial levers to the UK government, which would then result in micromanagement of the devolved finances. So that would negate the strength of the 1999 fiscal settlement. So given the differences uh, that the economies and the funding arrangement across the UK have, um, Johnny described the four different cap policies that are currently in place. Um, I'm interested to hear about how the frameworks could be fairly funded, what mechanisms should be used to ensure that the financial levers of each administration currently have, how, are, how can they be preserved? Thank you. Um, there's been quite a few comments made by some of the, the academics involved in this, as well as RSP, BSE, Link, etc. Colin, did you...? Well, I'll just say, our, our comments were primarily about the funding arrangements for the, sec for the Secretariat, whatever institutional structures are, rather than the funding arrangements, the substantive funding arrangements that would flow oh, right. in relation to agriculture, other areas of support. I think that if you're particularly... If you're going to have any institutional structure which is meant to oversee compliance with common frameworks to provide the backup to make sure that common frameworks are properly researched, properly backed up beforehand. That, okay. that structure needs funding. There's then a whole okay. separate set of issues on the substantive matters. OK, on, on substantive matters, I think, Johnny, you're probably the one representative in here who's, who's got... A, 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 others have too, but you, the, the area you cover, there's, there are specifics there you might want to pick up on, and obviously... RSPB will be the same. I'm sure SE Link will want to make some comments, and MDL she wants to as well. Please feel free. John? I will, I will comment. Uh, I mean, almost regardless of the, the Brexit process we find ourselves in, there's always been a debate and discussion about how agricultural funding via the Common Agricultural Poli Policy comes into the UK and how that should be allocated across the devolved administrations. And that particularly was... Um, brought to the fore back in 2013-14 when the UK was awarded the, what was called the Convergence Uplift, pre predominantly because of uh, Scotland's uh, extensive areas of rough grazing, therefore bringing the UK's average payment below the 90% threshold, which then allowed the United Kingdom to receive further funding from the CAP. Pretty complicated stuff. But at the time, the UK government took the decision uh, back in 2013 to basically allocate that uplift in funding to the UK on the same historic basis that funds were already allocated. So that Scotland only got 16% of the uplift, yet Scotland was by and large responsible for the 100% of the uplift. And therefore, the argument being it should have come to Scotland. So that ignited a whole debate about um, the basis for allocation of funding. Um, that particular process goes on with Michael Gove, Secretary of State for DEFRA, um, announcing just rec very recently that uh, eventually, finally, a review of uh, cap funding would take place. Um, it was been promised uh, for a number of years, and that is now going to happen. But the terms of reference of that review were not what we were uh, promised in the first place. It would be very limited. It will take us to 2022 or, or the lifetime of the Parliament uh, and won't do much to really... Um, address issues of how funding might be allocated beyond 2022. In fact, it will do little or nothing. A couple of, I think, really important points on this, though, which are really, really live issues right now. One relates to the Agriculture Bill, which was introduced to Westminster in September, which is going through the committee process now. In that Agriculture Bill, there is uh, a section, Part 7, uh, which relates to 
the UK's commitments to WTO obligations. And as part of that, it effectively gives the Secretary of State um, the, the power, because the UK is the signatory to the WTO agreement, the power to essentially, um, in theory, limit the amount of spending on different types of agricultural support measure. And therefore, that would, in theory, limit Scotland or another devolved administration's ability to spend how it would see fit in terms of the policy objectives it sought to achieve. And that is causing a great concern for ourselves and a great concern for the Scottish Government as well. And we are seeking to try and have that addressed as the Agriculture Bill goes through uh, the process, because it is about an issue about the Secretary of State for the UK having a significant power over devolved administrations, and the Welsh and the Northern Irish should and are equally concerned about that. Um, in terms of Emma Harper's point about population size and all the rest of it, another interesting point has been made just in the last week or so by Michael Gove and then reiterated by David Mundell as Secretary of State for Scotland that agricultural support would not be barnetised. Uh, there was a statement a week or so ago in the sense that, in, a, in effect, as we receive about 16 and a bit percent of the current cap allocation to Scotland, the, the rough equation is that, and we've, this committee's discussed it before, that that would see a, a, a reduction in funding as a consequence if it was based on an allocation on, of, of, of population alone. But the problem is that that statement or that commitment from Michael Gove, again, I don't think can hold water beyond 2022 or the lifetime of this parliament, whichever might come sooner, and who knows. Um, and therefore, in many ways, it's just a restatement of what the UK government have already said, that, that funding will be committed until such time as 2022. So... As an agricultural industry, and this applies to farmers in England, Wales and Northern Ireland, the uncertainty around future funding levels in terms of the quantum and the, then the allocation of that across the United Kingdom remains a really important issue. And it's not just the direct support into agriculture. It clearly interacts with agri-environment measures and other spending that's important in the delivery of, of, of public goods as well. Johnny, Daphne, you want to pick up on some of that? Then I'll come to Lloyd. Yes, I suppose just to echo some of the points you just made about public goods um, and, and Emma Harper, you mentioned kind of the, the fair, fair funding. In terms of the environment, uh, we've done some studies about the private funding that is available in Scotland and um, for environmental issues. And what we have found out is actually that Scotland, um, fewer investors see a Scotland as a destination for doing projects for the environment. So... Um, essentially there's a lot less funding opportunities in Scotland compared to the rest of the UK. Now if you couple that with the fact that we rely on dedicated EU funds for environmental projects, particularly for life funding, the future of that specific stream is very important for conservation in Scotland. And at the moment uh, Scotland benefits, um, it has about 21%, it utilises 21% of the uh, UK allocated funds. So again, if you were to looking to barnetize that or if there was another, another mechanism of distribution, that would probably create um, some consequences in Scotland. So what we would like to see is perhaps a formula or uh, some sort of mechanism that takes into account how much more of the environment Scotland has. If you look at the biodiversity, if you look at the important habitats that Scotland has, we've got quite a big proportion uh, from the UK total. And I think you could carry on that um, sort of line of thinking when we talk about the future of the farm payments. Again, there would be a great scope for Scottish farmers to benefit from a system that would reward them on the basis of the public goods, including environmental goods, um, that they could deliver, which would be of great value to uh, Scotland. And of course, we've got our... Um, we know from a survey, a public survey that we did, that this would actually be favoured by a majority of Scots. Um, one other funding stream that we haven't really touched upon, and I don't think there's been as much discussion perhaps in Scotland, is this uh, Shared Prosperity Fund, which will be kind of the, the new structural funds, essentially, um, that the UK government is 
currently delivering on. Again, perhaps just to highlight about how Scottish stakeholders are involved in those UK-wide discussions. While this has been an issue that we've raised again and again, we've only just found out that next week there will be um, some stakeholder meetings held in Edinburgh and Glasgow. Again, this is fairly short notice, doesn't allow for a lot of time of for consultation, so it just speaks to the, the better coordination that is needed on, on UK-wide issues. Lloyd. Thanks, Kavina. Uh, jo both Johnny and Daphne have said a lot of what I was going to say, so I'll just um, add one thing and then draw out a, a kind of what I think is a, a, a sort of principle that the committee might want to discuss. Um, in terms of environmental funding, I think uh, it's, it's, it is incredibly important um, because we kind of think of the environment, you know, Scotland's landscape and wildlife as something that's just given to us. But it, it needs investment. I mean, uh, 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 farmers and crofters who uh, benefit from agri-environment schemes deliver quite a lot of our environment. It's not given to us. It's something that needs investment. And it is, in fact, one of the internationally agreed HE targets under the Convention uh, for the Conservation of Biodiversity. And the most recent report from, from SNH, the the Scottish Government's Conservation Agency on how we're doing on meeting those targets uh, indicated that only one target will be moving away from target. We were doing quite well on 19 of the 20 targets, but on the 20th target, which was funding for the delivery of the environment, we were moving away. So I think it's very important that this is something that's addressed. But in terms of the overall principle, I think there's a bit of a dilemma here for, for politicians to consider, because um, many of the areas that f EU funding has supported over the years, whether it be hill farmers uh, in, in, in uplands, as Johnny described, or environmental bodies delivering projects uh, for, for wildlife, um, these are not distributed around the UK in the same pattern as human beings for obvious reasons, you know, um, and uh, for, for that, that means that the funding has not been distributed in the same way as uh, other political funding streams uh, over the years. So that, for instance, uh, Scotland, as Johnny says, has a, a disproportionate level of uh, CAP funding, and as Daphne said, we have a disproportionate level of uh, life funding over the last decades um, uh, and therefore you know this parliament and uh, the Welsh and Northern Ireland uh, politicians and uh, UK government have therefore got to consider whether in terms of how things are how these funding streams are going to re be replaced are they going to be focused on the outcomes <laughs> Are they going to be distributed according to the outcomes uh, and the the, uh, the issues that they're trying to address, or are they going to simply leave it to uh, retain uh, the the autonomy of every jurisdiction and put every stream of money into a kind of central pot that has a single formula that divides it up? And that's a that is something that has not been decided, and that is that is a result of what was. I think, it, uh, I think it was Michael Keating said earlier on that the, the devolution settlement was developed at the time when the EU was in place and there was no question of that uh, changing. And therefore, all of these EU type of funds were distributed according to EU rules that were, in fact, focused on the outcomes. So the, the CAP funding went to where the farmers were and the life funding went to where the environment was. Uh, and, you know, if we take away that EU outcome-focused uh, funding, then we either need to reinvent that wheel within the UK or lots of uh, areas of importance, including agriculture and the environment, will suffer. Model. Thank you, Convener. Um, I just wanted to pick up on the point that Johnny Hall made about agricultural funding that touches on, on wider issues. And, and the point was that you know, there's no certainty post-2022 as to where these funding streams might go, which is a consequence of the fact that, you know, under our constitutional arrangements, no parliament can bind its successor. We don't know who will be in government post-2022. There might well be a change. Um, so, it, it, you know, is the suggestion that somehow common framework funding should be detached from the political cycle? And how would that work in practice, given... You know, these, surely these are political choices. Surely it will be up to 
the voters to decide who goes into government in 2022 and a manifesto setting out funding, or is is the proposal from NFU Scotland that somehow this should be separated from, from politics? I'm, I'm just curious. I'm going to let you answer that, Jonathan, then I'm going to come to Ian Wright, because I think, I think you made comments in, in regard to the impact of further complexity to devolve financing as a result of where we're going, if I've got that right. Yeah, it's uh, David Heald's there. I wondered when I saw the terminology if it was you or David Heald. <laughs> <laughs> I wondered. But if, if you wish to comment, please feel free. But Jonathan, in the meantime. I guess in, in response to Murdo's uh, question, um, agriculture is a long-term game, as is managing the environment. And unfortunately, politics is a much shorter game, and it can be very short for some people. Um, <laughs> And what, what, what uh, farmers and crofters and other land managers in Scotland are desperate for in, in many senses now is a degree of certainty as to what's going to happen next. And one of the things that the common agricultural policy has actually afforded us is, is a very consistent seven-year cycle, both in terms of funding and in terms of policy. So there's the, the multi-annual financial framework which is basically the funding settlement for the CAP and other elements of, of EU spend. Um, that is agreed uh, through the European process, uh, and the next round of that will effectively kick off from 2020, uh, and, and it will chime with a common agricultural policy, which will, which will, will, will run through from 2021 through to 2027. And having that sort of window whereby there's a, there's a high, much higher degree of certainty regardless of other political changes, uh, is really quite important. Um, how each government then utilises the funds is another question, because clearly the, 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 the choices as to how those funds might be spent within Scotland or, the, or other parts of the UK or other member states is down to, to, to those administrations. Um, and that's, again, I guess that, you know, that, that's where Lloyd and I will, will agree and then suddenly disagree about what the emphasis of funding might be in Scotland. But the, the, the fact of the matter is that there's a higher degree of certainty through that mechanism because of the, the multi-annual process that, that the EU la lays down. And in some ways, as, a, as an agricultural organisation, we'd like to see something like that replicated so that you could have a change of government, but by and large there'd be a longer-term commitment in there that, that the government might shift the emphasis of how the money is spent, but the, the, the money and the... And the the broad agricultural and rural development framework that we operate is a given for a longer period than maybe the lifetime of a parliament. Because lifetimes of parliaments can be very short. And the constant chopping and changing of, of, of first policy and then because of that, where money is then di distributed and, and what, what it is spent upon is, is a very unsettling process when we're talking about long-term investment in agricultural businesses and long-term investment in the environment, which Lloyd uh, referred to. So maybe a bit of a fudge, but I think uh, if we're going to deliver the outcomes that we want from this public investment in farming, forestry, environmental management and all the rest of it, then that longer-term certainty is an absolute requirement because it's not a short-term game. We're talking generations sometimes. The whole of Brexit is being a fudge at the moment, but never mind. Michael, I yeah, think the, you, the, you, the, you the, some comments to make. Yeah, around there's a huge, huge, huge amounts of uncertainty about this funding business. One, one thing we're pretty sure of is that agricultural spending in England will fall, and anything that links Scottish spending to English spending, whether it's Barnet or whatever, that will have an effect on Scotland. Scotland has decided pretty much that it wants to keep direct support for farmers. England and Wales have both decided they don't want to. That's going to cost money. There's a huge implication there. The Welsh government and civil servants on behalf of Northern Ireland have bought into the UK agricultural bill, which provides some kind of framework. Scotland hasn't. So we don't know what's going to happen to that uh, or what's going to happen to Scottish funding, I think indications that have been coming out more recently would suggest that in agriculture there will probably be more latitude for the distinct administrations to do differently than we might have thought a few months ago, but, but we, we really don't know. And then again, to go back to the internal market, that could cut across agriculture. Although agricult the agriculture bill is separate, nevertheless, that could any, any single market principle could cut across 
that therefore that would implicate uh, or have implications for what Scotland could do. And then uh, Johnny mentioned this little clause in the Agriculture Bill that we both spotted there that actually does give the Secretary of State extraordinary powers to determine using the WTO mechanism what funding will be available in Scotland. So it's huge amounts of uncertainty. The Shared Prosperity Fund, this seems to come out of the structural funds and probably pillar two of the agricultural funds, which is also to do with territorial spending. Uh, I've been trying to work out for 43 years, <laughs> that is since 1975, how the structural funds and their predecessors work <laughs> and whether the money is additional. This Parliament has done at least two inquiries, and the answer is we just don't know. Uh, we just don't know whether this money is additional to what would come anyway and how it links with the block allocation uh, funding formula. So uh, since we don't know what we're getting at the moment, it's very difficult to know what we would get in the future. Uh, but it, uh, the, it does been, it's been suggested there will be a shared prosperity fund. That raises issues about the shares of that, how that will be distributed, uh, and when it will, whether it will reflect the previous spending on structural funds plus pillar two of the agricultural policy. We don't know. Uh, and then the question of how that will be managed it seems to me likely that this will be used in the way that the existing EU funds are used, or city deals are used, that is to lever funding from devolved and local governments. There will be matching funds. These will be intergovernmental programmes. Now, some people think that is a wasteful way of using public money. Have yet another set of intergovernmental mechanisms on top of what we've already got, city deals uh, and all the rest of it. I know some people in the UK government uh, are very doubtful about it. But politically, it's extremely attractive to the UK government to demonstrate that it's spending money in Scotland and Wales and all that has a presence there, try and lever some funding from the devolved governments to get common UK priorities. So that might be an instrument to get common policies around various fields. That's, that's all we know at, at the moment, and there are very substantial amounts, amounts of money uh, involved. Yeah, I'll come to you. Uh, and before I do so, there's a quote in the paper which, is for, 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 for which you were given about some of the comments made by either yourself or um, David Heald. Giving financial levers to the UK government would result in micromanagement of devolved finances, thus negating one of the strengths of the 1999 fiscal st settlement. Yourself or David Heald? Uh, <laughs> that particular one was, uh, was David. And I know his uh, concern was the interaction between um, Barnett and, uh, and whatever comes out of, uh, of funding common frameworks. Um, but two other very short points I would make is, one is in relation to the MFF. We have been looking at this and wondering if there might be some uh, way to adopt a similar kind of process, notwithstanding the fact that uh, UK has never, as far as I know, um, been involved in uh, a multi-annual uh, type of budgeting. Um, on the other hand, the uh, payment of the divorce bill, should that ever uh, actually happen, I understand that there is a mechanism whereby certain um, elements of uh, expenditure are not included in the, the budget because they, they just go through and perhaps somebody with expertise in that area might like to comment. Okay. Thank you, folks. I think that kind of naturally brings us to the end of that quite remarkable discussion. I thought that was very, very useful. So I'd like to thank our witnesses for their contribution, which was, as I say, is a useful contribution. And no, I have no doubt will be helpful us in helping us form our report when we come to that. And given Michael's clancy warning about timescale, maybe we need to do that quicker than I originally thought. Um, but, but it's been a very useful uh, and educational and, and informative discussion. So I, I thank everyone sincerely who's attended to contribute today. Uh, and I now sus suspend this meeting because we're going to the next bit. The meeting will be in private to allow for witnesses to leave. Thank you very much.